Happy Friday, everybody. Praise be to God. It is Friday again, and it is time for Bible study in Job. I am very grateful for that. It's good to be here with you on this premiere. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about spacesuits and different things like that. It'll be pretty cool as we go through the book of Job. And we're not the hidden truth talking about the uh, book of Obadiah and the white man's space station is what they told me years ago. But we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And I uh, love you guys and uh, glad to be here. So let's pray first. Father. I lift up each and every person who's going to be joining us today, Lord Jesus, and ask, Father, that you'd be over them. Father, help us to come to know you as Lord and Savior. If we don't know you, Father, there are going to be many people that uh, usually join us that don't know you, Father. So, Lord, I pray that you would just do that. Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts, and uh, for those who do know you, that you would draw us closer, more intimately closer, Father, as we go through this uh, continued study of Job. And, Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would allow every word from my mouth to be of you today, Father God, that we give you glory, that we give you honor, and we give you praise. I love you. I thank you. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise be to God. It's great to be here today on this Friday, and uh, we are going to be in Job chapter 13 today. Praise God. Last week, we heard from uh, Zophar. Uh, Zophar was one of the worst of the three friends that visited Job, and we're not talking about Zoltar, the Zoltar, the um, the uh, machine that was in the movie Big with Tom Hanks, uh, but he was a the harshest of all three friends. Uh, he was a delight to be around, and I'm being sarcastic about that. Then we saw Job; he got to a breaking point. And they pushed him to that point, and he began to doubt himself, actually, and the integrity that he had. People can do that. If we know that what we're doing is right, sometimes even our friends can say, well, you know, this is God. God's allowing you to suffer because of the fact that you're not doing right. You need to get right with God. Um, people can do that. They can question what we do sometimes, and sometimes the Lord will call us to do some interesting things. Uh, I recently had um, someone over the past six months that had done this to me, and uh, they're probably going to continue to do it to me until I get through this process. Um, they're, pro they're in the process of making money off of me. They want to make some money off of me. They started um, negotiations by making everything sound extremely promising, uh, then talked about how they have our best interests at heart, that that's what they're looking for, and they want the best for me. That's what they said. Then each time that I talk to them, they tend to get worse. And uh, they, they'll lie. They'll say that I lied, and I never did. And they'll be like, well, you know, you said this, and I never said it. But then I do question it because of the fact, well, maybe I did say it. And I look back on the conversation and I even ask other people who were involved in that conversation. I said, you never said that. You know, I don't know why they're saying that. So um, then, you know, but they'll say one thing and then they'll do something else. But afterwards with the backstabbing, you know, they say after all that, they'll be like, well, you know, we want what's best for you. We want everything that's best for you. Um, and as I look back on the stress, um, the headaches, the heartaches, I can say these three friends that we're going through and we're learning about Job are just like the people that I'm dealing with today. Though they're not my friend or out for my best interest, they say they are. I um, even recently went to their website to read about them and it says they'll do everything they can to help get, you know, basically to get money, to get what they want. Um, being I'm the one on the opposite end of that deal, I can see how well it's going and how I've been treated through all of this. Um, but we'll see where it goes. I mean, the Lord's in charge. Praise be to God. But the thing is, because that's the thing, God is in control. God is in control of everything. And that takes the stress out of all of this moving forward. Um, Job, he hit rock bottom. And his so-called friends kept kicking him while he was down. They continue to kick him while he's down. And uh, with friends like that, who needs enemies? They seem to only want to be right. 
and it's sad. And when we're empathizing or when we're helping somebody who's been knocked down, the best thing that we can do is not to prove that we're right, but to be for be there for them and to show them love. So um, we're going to continue to discuss this this week. We're in Job chapter 13, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you can pause this on the YouTube page after the live is done. And um, you can follow along with us. Job 13, 1 says, My eyes have seen all this. My ears have heard and understood it. Job saw and understood all these things. Verse 2. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. He, so he's answering the argument that they have. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. Once again, we're going back to the court. The Hebrew indicated here what he said was he'd rather talk to God than these three knuckleheads. You know, he don't want to talk to Eliphaz, Bildad, and and so far because of the fact that they're just not being nice to him. They're not treating him very well. And he'd rather talk to God than to these three knuckleheads. Um, this is another courtroom term as he's studying, as he were reading this. I desire Hebrew to plead my case before God. In Isaiah, God does reason many years later with us as well. It says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, which I love this verse, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Come, let us reason together. Job said he wanted to reason with God. He would be a pleasure to talk to compared to these three people that keep getting on him. Verse 4, you, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. Okay, so they couldn't diagnose an issue or a problem. They were good and falsely, and they were falsely diagnosing him. He, he, Satan was the one that was causing all this, not Job, but they were accusing Job, and they didn't have a cure for it. They were just diagnosing him. These are terrible doctors. You know, I always like to tell people they would make terrible doctors because they have no patience. That's a bad dad joke, so. They could not diagnose or prescribe anything to heal him. Verse 5. If only you would be altogether silent, for you that would be wisdom. In other words, shut your mouth and you'd look wise. It's better to be quiet. Solomon said that. It's better to be quiet and have people think that we're fools than open our mouths and remove all doubt of that. Solomon said this many years in Proverbs too. He said that if the, the quieter that we look, the smarter we look pretty much. I have a friend like that. Uh, his name's Phil. He will sit quietly. He will be there and he won't speak. Then when he does, it's usually something that's very wise and very profound. This is how we should be. We shouldn't be running our mouths, but we should be listening. We should be empathizing. And then when we need to say something or feel led to say something uh, by the Lord, that's when we usually should do that. Um, verse 6, hear now my argument, listen to the pleas of my lips. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? Will you show him partiality? This is how we should be. They said and slandered God's nature is what they're doing here by saying that God punished Job. They had no clue what was going on. Um, Job let them know they promoted that. And if we walk with God and do what he wants, they're saying he prospers us. If we deny God, then he judges us. It's the prosperity gospel. I hear it all the time, the blab it and grab it, the name it and claim it. It's heresy. It was heresy back then in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Job, and it is heresy now that God has to bless us like the daddy warbucks in the sky, that we're all the little orphan annies trying to do right and do good, and he gives us what we desire if we do that. Riches beyond measure. You know, he's going to reward us and give us all those things when sometimes, if you look at the world, the wicked will prosper. 
You know, look at politics. Look at all the things that are going on in Washington. You know, sometimes, a lot of times, people who are wicked, they will prosper. People who are innocent will sometimes suffer. When Hurricane Katrina happened, uh, and it happened here in Louisiana, Texas, this is where we're at, um, one pastor who has the largest church in America said when they were asked about Hurricane Katrina, said, well, they had faith for everyone in New Orleans that was going through it, that those who lost their homes, he, he said, we have faith for you. We have faith. God's going to give you a bigger, more expensive home. Those who lost their car, God's going to give you a more expensive one. Those who lost their possessions, God will give you more expensive ones. They usually start to talk like this and elongate their words. Then he spouted this through the whole episode. You know, well, if you have faith, you're going to get it. Did everyone get these things? I know I live in this area. You know, did everybody get those things? I talked to people here, and guess what? They didn't. My friend had a vehicle, um, and he had a ton of faith. You know, when he was alive, he had a ton of faith. He had a vehicle that wound up flooding in the parking lot of the church, and it wouldn't start. He finally had a guy come tow it away many years later, but it sat in the parking lot until then. These three friends are trying, they're trying to convince Job and us about positive confession, prosperity doctrine, that if we do for God, he's going to bless us, that it's all black and white and no gray, that we can't, if we're doing everything for the Lord, that nothing negative can happen in our lives. Meanwhile, I see filthy rich people that hate God, they support horrible atrocities, wicked people that prosper, that's, that supposedly there are no righteous people that suffer, and this is what happens is they place God in a box. And we can't do that. We can't place God in a box. The people that told me, and I had this happen one time, and these were people in my church, they said Johnny Erickson Tata, and if you don't know who she is, she's a beautiful woman of God, and she's been in a wheelchair all her life, and she's a wonderful, faithful Christian. Some of the times when she teaches, it brings tears to my eyes because she's just, she just loves Jesus so much. And they said if she had enough faith that she could get up and get out of that wheelchair. When she calls her wheelchair her throne. Because it's drawn her so close to Jesus. It's developed a beautiful relationship with Jesus. When she has more faith in her little pinky than all those people in that group combined. You know? But this prosperity, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it and all this stuff, you know, God will bless you, yes. God does bless people. He does bless us. But, you know, just to say, well, God's never going to allow anything bad to happen to me because of the fact that I'm doing good all the time. And if I do, and if something bad does happen to me, that God's the one causing it, these people, these people, these three friends, they're knuckleheads. They just don't know what they're talking about. Now, verse 9 says, Would it turn out well if he examined you? Could you deceive him as you might deceive a mortal? He would surely call you to account if you secretly showed partiality. He will surely reprove you, especially since you believe you have it all figured out. These three friends are like, well, you know, Job, you, you did wrong and you need to repent. You need to turn to God when he didn't do anything wrong. Well, verse 11, would not his splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of him fall on you? The idea here in the Hebrew is exactly what the word says, terror. He is, God is unsearchable, God is excellent, he is amazing, and when we look at God, we shouldn't question or we should be in awe of God, in his awesomeness, in his magnificence, because he's just such an awesome and holy and wonderful God. Years ago, there was a country band called Florida Georgia Line, and they came out with a song called Holy. 
And it totally ticked me off because of the fact that the word holy should only be used for God. No one else. And it was a, it was a stupid song. I know a bunch of people that got on board. They probably didn't even remember it until I brought it up. I actually rewrote it and put it on my um, put it on one of my YouTube pages. I rewrote the whole thing and I put it focusing to the glory of God and not on some woman. You know that God is the only one that's holy. And we should be in awe of Him. We should worship and praise Him. The um, Verse 12 says, your maxims of proverbs of ashes, your defenses are defenses of clay. Um, your proverbs, these three friends, they're like ashes. Their advice has no warmth and the heat went out of them. You know, they're cold people. They're cold by what they say to Job. Job lost all his, he lost, um, he lost everything. He lost 10 kids. And they're just like saying all these horrible things to Job. Now, the, the part here that they're talking about in this verse is the center part of a shield. It's called the bolt. Um, that if a sword hit it, um, because of the fact that it'd be made out of clay, you wouldn't make it out of clay because if you did, it would shatter. The idea here is Job is saying their arguments, if they were like a shield like that, they're like clay and ashes. That the clay would break if somebody attacked them. That they would blow away like ashes in the wind without any substance. You know, Job was good at cutting people up pretty much. Uh, verse 13. Keep silent and let me speak. Then let, then let come to me what may. Leave me alone. Stop blaming me. Stop saying that I did something wrong. Let me plead my case to the Lord. You know, verse 14. Why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. This is a very famous verse here. No matter what happens, no matter what we lose, no matter how we feel, we should always trust God 100%. That is a tough verse. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. It's best to leave the sense of it this way. Put it in Job's entire context. What he said was, I would go to court with God. I would plead my case before him. They believed he was insane to do that, these three friends. That why would he put his life in his own hands to do this? Though he slay me, I would still hope in him. And the idea there is that he would plead and stand before him because God is our salvation. Verse 16. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. For no godless person would dare come before him. So only someone who's sunk down that far could say that. People tell me they can't go before God with everything. That I, well, I, I can't talk to God you know, and say those things to him. He already knows. God knows if you're angry, he knows that you're already angry. He knows how angry you are. He knows how enraged you might be. He knows how upset. He knows how mad we are already. Why not go before the one who can heal us? That always doesn't make sense to me when people say that, well, I can't go talk to God about this because I'm just so angry. And I can't go before him and talk. Well, yes, you can. Look at David in the Psalms. He went before God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Is anger connected to anxiety and worry? Yes, it is. So we can take that. Lord, I am angry. I have gone, I remember I, I would go to the church sometimes and I would lock the doors because I live next door and I would sit and I would just scream. I'd be like, Lord, I'm angry. 
I am really angry right now. I can't believe that this is happening to so and so and and what the what's happening in their lives and Lord, I'm just mad about it. I'm mad at what's taking place and I I wish you would intervene. I wish you would step in. I wish that you would do something about it. It's okay to be angry. I've never been angry at God, but I've been angry and gone to God and expressed the anger that I had. David was great at this. Just read the Psalms. Think of it. Like God, he would say things like, God, knock their teeth out. God, destroy them. God, send them to hellfire. Send all your enemies that go against you to hell. I can't stand my enemies. Things we should never say. And David said them to God. David did, and he understood that God already saw his heart. He already knew what he was thinking. And we need to release those things, because if we don't release them, we're going to be in bondage to them. If we don't release the bitterness, if we don't release the anger, if we don't release the unforgiveness, if we don't release our bad attitudes to Jesus, it's just going to fester inside of us and get worse. Jesus is our salvation. And Job was not a hypocrite here. It says in verse 17, Listen carefully to what I say. Let my words ring in your ears. Now that I have prepared my case, I know that I will be vindicated. Job knew that he was right. Job had the confidence. But then you have Zophar aggravated him to the point where Job you know, needs to just move forward and go talk to the Lord. Verse 19, can anyone bring charges against me? If so, I will be silent and die. If I keep my mouth shut, I might as well pass away, is what he's saying. I better, I, I'm going to say something, and if I don't, I might as well just pass away. Now, we're going to see in verse 20, Job got his focus back, which is good. He turned away from the so-called friends, these three friends that are just beating him up, and he turns back to the Lord in verse 20, and it says here in verse 20, only grant me these two things. Ready? What are the two things? God, and then I will not hide from you. Number one, withdraw your hand from me and stop frightening me with your terrors. Two things there. Number one, the idea here is withdrawing this affliction, the, the sores and the terrible things that are going on with his body. This was the first request that Job had for God. Please, Lord, heal me. And number two, stop me from being afraid. You know, because Job knew who God was. He understood the awesomeness of who God is. Verse 22, then summon me and I will answer, or let me speak and you reply to me. There's a huge struggle here. Job is still in court with God. He's still in the courtroom. He's still pleading his case. God is sovereign. He is the judge. He's on the throne. And here's the best part. He loves us. God loves us. If he is all these amazing things, and this is what people say to me, um, especially non-believers, if he's all these amazing things, and if he's in control of everything, then why am I in this mess? Why is this happening to me? Uh, you know, I was talking about releasing all those things, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness. That's what this book is about. It's a book about healing. One of my favorite devotionals, that I wrote in this book. There's 365 of them in here. And one of the devotionals that I wrote in this book took me five years to write. Five years. Not one book. Not writing. It took me five years to write the whole book, but it took me five years to write one of the devotionals in the book. You know, the first half of the devotional I wrote about how I got robbed. You know, I wrote how I got robbed and how all these terrible things happened to me. That I pray, and this is the thing, I would leave the house and say, Lord, protect my house, protect my dogs, protect this house. Lord, be over it. And then I come home and my back door is slammed open and, you know, 
look after my homes because he because he's good god is good then i came home one night to the back door smashed into an empty house my dog missing and heartache i swept the house with my gun to make sure that no one was in there then after the police left i barricaded the door and made sure nobody could get in but why I was like, why? Three robberies later, I met my future wife and I moved to Texas. That was the second half. That's the one that took me five years. The first half and then the second half five years later about how well my life went. But at the beginning, there were misunderstandings. There was pain. Why would God allow me to get robbed when I pray all the time that it wouldn't happen? Because we can't see the full picture. We can't see it. We can't see what's going to happen. You know, why would God have Abraham wait till he was 100 to have a child? You know, his wife was 90 years old. Why did he do it? To display his power. To show him a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old can have a child if they're in God. Nothing's impossible. Why would God lead, instead of leading him around the Red Sea or anywhere near like any other direction, lead him to the Red Sea? Why would he lead him there? Because to display his power and to open up the Red Sea and to destroy the Egyptian army when they went through. But you don't understand that when you're standing in the middle of, you see a, a sea in front of you and you can't get, and the army's coming down to get you. Why would God have Israel praise and worship and walk around a large wall in Jericho? And then the seventh day be like, well, praise me seven times. Walk around and praise me seven times and blow the trumpets and I'll take care of the wall. Because God wanted to display his power. He is in control of all things. He knocked down the walls at Jericho. Why would God send the disciples into a storm? He knew the storm was going to be there. And then he walks out on the water. Peter walks on the water. And then he goes and he says, be still. And the storm goes. And it says, if you look at it in the language, it doesn't say like, oh, the storm slowly dissipated. It says immediately it stopped. Be still. Immediately stopped. To show that he's in control of everything. Why would Paul... And Barnabas fight in Acts chapter 12. Why would that take place? Because what happened was they split and they became two evangelistic teams that went off in two different directions and they impacted the kingdom double. They didn't know the end of the story. I didn't know the end of the story. When I was in the middle of getting robbed three times, I didn't know the end of the story then what, you know, we read the end. We know the end because we read it in the Bible, but they didn't. I didn't know. That is the magnificence of God. We always need answers, and Job now is going to ask for this. He's going to ask for answers. Verse 23, How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Show me my offense and my sin. Where have I gone wrong? Reveal it to me, verse 24. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? We get the sense of Job giving into the pressure here to his three friends. This was not true at all. Behind the scenes, God said that he was proud of Job, if you go back to the first chapter, that he was a righteous and blameless man. Then he told our greatest enemy, who's Satan, all these truths. Have you seen my wonderful, righteous, and blameless servant, Job? You know? Who was his real enemy behind the scenes? The real enemy was Satan. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. One of my favorites. I love this verse. I have a lot of favorites, though. My friend, Brother Dwayne, he'd say, I have a lot of, I, this is my favorite, but I have a lot of favorites. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember, this is extremely important. Condemnation is never from God, but from the devil. 
If you are feeling condemned inside, it is not from God. Conviction is always from God. It is a way for us to realize that we are wrong and we need to confess it. Then move on in forgiveness. But condemnation is never from God. 1 John 1, 9 through 10 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Conviction, then confession. Never condemnation. Never condemnation. If we feel condemned, it's never from God. It's always from Satan. So if you feel like you are condemned right now, if you have condemnation in your heart, that is not from God, and you need to get that out of your system right now. Because the devil used all of this, including Job's friends, to find a way to get to Job through them. Because all these debates that these friends supposed friends gave him are the same ones if you look at chapter 1 are the same ones that Satan gave to God Job only loves God because of what he gets from him that's what he's saying because of what God does for Job there are little moments in their friends debates where they're spewing demonic garbage and the same accusation Satan gave to God because the devil will use us sometimes as his tool to destroy others. Verse 25, will you torment a windblown leaf? Will you chase after a dry chaff? Does, Job does a comparison to himself now to these things and said he had nothing left. For you write down bitter things against me and make me reap the sins of my youth. Wrong again, Job. No. God said wonderful things about you at the beginning of this book and this process. Job reevaluated himself even to the point of his youth and wondered if he did something wrong when he was younger. We tend to do that sometimes. Oh, well, maybe I did something in my past. You know, maybe the Lord's punishing me for something that I did wrong in my past. With Jesus, after we confess those things and release them, the word says in Psalm 103, verses 12 through 14, As far as from the east from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassions on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. God forgave our past. We just tend to hold on to them. We love to just hold on to them and feel condemned. Forgiven means 100% with Jesus. We can't look, we can look back on all the messes that we've caused, yes. The garbage that we left behind. Then remember though that God forgave it. He removed all. Not 50% of our sins, not 60% or 75%. He removed all of our mistakes, all of our sins. Then praise, we need to praise and be thankful for that, praise God. God is not out to get us. He is the Father God. He's not the God Father. Verse 27 you fasten my feet in shackles. You keep close watch on all my paths by putting marks on the soles of my feet. I feel like I'm hedged in is what he's saying here. The marks from the chains that I'm actually wound up in the chains. Verse 28. So man wastes away like something rotten, like a garment eaten by moths. Now, there's no chapter break here as we go into Job 14.1. Mortals born of God are a few days and full of trouble. No gender identity confusion there. You know, there's all this identity confusion in the world. But here, mortals born of women are a few days and full of trouble. Time goes fast. You know, this thing that we have here, I like to call it the spacesuit sometimes. Same 17 elements that make up dirt. 
we're just dwelling in it the soul the most beautiful part of our body the soul just dwells in this this part one day is going to go on the ground it's going to die physically it's going to die but what's inside of us never dies never goes i remember a wonderful man that i knew uh he was a good friend of mine I uh, used to work in a nursing home. I had lots of really good friends. Hung out with a lot of the elderly. He opened up for Frank Sinatra and other stars in the Rat Pack. Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Joey Bishop. We talked one day, and him and I were sitting in uh, the day room, and he was telling me something really profound. He said, he said, Michael, one minute I was singing in front of thousands of people. I was performing, um, you know, I was making money. People were cheering and clapping. And the next minute, I'm just, I was, I'm sitting here in this wheelchair. It goes fast. Time is a vapor, James said. Like heating up water. If you heat up tea, you see all that steam coming up. It comes and it goes really quick. That's our lives. The vapors come, then disappear that quick. This space suit, this carcass that we have, one day will go into the ground. What is 70 years, which is the average lifespan, compared to an eternity? You know, my birthday is this week. I'm going to be 54 years old. In 16 years, I'm going to be 70. That's going to go by real quick. Verse 2. They sprung up like flowers and wither away like fleeting shadows. They do not endure. We show up, Job is saying. We smell good. We bud. And then we wither away. You know, I hung out with a lot of groups um, back in the day when I was sharing Christ with people. And even before then, I hung out with these people called Goths. Um, I think they changed their name. They went from being Goths to being Emos at one point. But these Goths that I hung out with, they wore all black clothes all the time. It was funny because I was hanging out with one of them one time and I looked out at their laundry and they had all their laundry up on the, on the, hanging up on the line. It was like black pants, black shirts, black underwear, black, black stuff all hanging up on the laundry there. It was funny. Um, they wore black clothes, black lipstick, black nail polish. And the men also wore the same things as well, including the nail polish. And they were as pale as a ghost. They wore depression like a badge of honor. I mean, I, I dated a couple of them before I got saved, and I just couldn't handle being with them. I couldn't. It was a, they focused on depression. They were always sad. They focused on death. I, I dated one woman that wanted to get married on Halloween. They were sad about everything in life. I mean, everything in their life, they were depressed. They were fleeting shadows, fixated on passing away one day. Oh, we're here for a moment and then we go. They loved flowers, and if you gave them flowers, you'd either have to give them black roses or you would have to give them dead ones. They didn't, you know, it's, we don't endure. Life is short. One day we're here, the next day we're gone. Who will we live for? Will we live for ourselves or are we living for Jesus? I look forward to one day being a part of the wedding feast, to one day go home. I have joy. I don't have depression. I'm not like these goths and emos that, you know, you hang out with them and they were just depressed. I look forward to eternity. To You know, I'm enjoying my life now, but I know one day it's going to end. And I look forward to the fact that one day when it ends, I'm going to be with the Lord. Verse 3 says, Do you fix your eyes on them? Will you bring them before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one. People don't have their opinions uh, of this in our world today. You know, I watched a show last night where in all the seasons that I've watched this show, um, you know, the people in the show, they had to work out all the time. We have to exercise. We can't eat carbs. We, we have to get our Botox. 
Um, some of them were getting surgical procedures to improve parts of their body, including their faces. They think that they're sticking around. They attempt to doll up this spacesuit. We're going to make it look better. We're going to make it feel better. Now, I'm not against health. I have no problem with people being healthy. I lost a lot of weight recently. I lost 140 pounds recently. But I did not do it to make this thing look better. This same thing that makes up the same 17 elements that make up dirt. I didn't do it to improve this. I did it because I wanted to be healthier. We do, you know, I did it because with the life that I have left, I want to feel healthy. I want to feel alive. I want to serve Jesus. I want to live a long life with my wife. But this body is the same 17 elements biologically that make up dirt. Paul called it a carcass. Job earlier in a couple chapters called it a moth-eaten garment. It's what we have, but inside is the real treasure. You know, our world does not think eternally. The difference between animals and us are we ponder on the purpose of life because it goes fast. You know, nothing increases death. It's total. It's a totality in every situation. Out of every hundred people that are alive, a hundred people are going to die. War and disease do not increase it. Death is total in every generation, whether you're 15 years old or 105 years old. We should number our days and we should live wisely. It's what we should do. Psalm chapter 90 verses 12 through 14 says this, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. We are wise. We're to be wise. We're to remember that our time is limited on this planet. We don't want to be like goths. They're like, oh, I'm so depressed. My life is so... Let me go listen to The Cure. Let me go listen to Nine Inch Nails and The Cure and get depressed. You know, we're to be wise. We're to remember that our time is limited. Our Verse 5, you know, Job continues, A person's days are determined. You have a decreed number of his months. Notice he says God, his months. And have set limits he cannot exceed. This is a interesting theological statement for someone that lived before the patriarchal age. He's saying our days are determined. That God knows the day that I'm going to pass away. He knows the day that I was born. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Before the foundation of the world, God knew that I was going to be born October 5th, 1970, and he knows the day that I'm going to pass away, which is pretty awesome. And the cool part is I don't have to worry about it like some goth is going to be like, oh, I'm so depressed. One day I'm going to die. It's so horrible. Oh, I feel so black. My heart is so black. Man, it was hard being around people like that. I pray for them. I pray that they get out of that depression. Paul said in Acts 20, all the threats on his life, none of them moved him. He knew there was a course set out. Good works foreordained. We are his poema, the Greek word poema. We are his poem, his story. We're in expression and workmanship, an artistic, emotional expression. As an artist, I love those verses. You know, artistically, we are his emotional expression. We're the poem of, we're the poem of our lives. And as we write that poem, he loves that. He loves the story that we have. We are the light of the world, the Bible says. The salt of the earth. Us alone. Jesus said it's emphatic. We alone are the salt of the earth. We alone are the light of the world. Jesus shines through us. God desires to express himself through his people. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us 
that we might become the righteousness of God. Now before us are good works foreordained to walk into. Then, after we get do these foreordained works, we get rewarded for it. He saves, he rewards, he sets things aside for us to step to, into. Then we have joy as we do those things. Then we through that express who he is to a lost world. He does them through us and then he rewards us for it. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing life. It's an amazing adventure and a wonderful retirement plan. We can live out all our days, but not outlive them. We, let me repeat that. This is a theological thing. We can live out all our days, but we cannot outlive them. What will we do with those days? Because there's going to come a time when that day will come. What do we do before then? Verse 6, So look away from him and let him alone till he has put in his time like a hired laborer. Turn away and let me put in my time like a hireling. Let me clock in and then I'll clock out. We clocked in. I clocked in in 1970 and one day I'm going to clock out. Verse 7, At least there is hope for a tree. Okay. If it's cut down, it'll sprout again and its new shoots will not fail. I'm telling you, this is my annual fight. Man, oh man. I have two acres of property out here. I spend, I'll go out there and I will work on a tree for a, I worked on some of these trees for like a year. I get them cut and then guess what happens? Because they have roots and I don't get the roots out, guess what happens? They sprout again. Before I move, you know, before I move, which they're going to turn this uh, property into a road next year, we have an apple tree. I pruned back the apple tree this year. It sprouted from a pear tree that got taken out from a hurricane. That tree is a mess. I mean, it got broken in half this year before they put the road through my house and yard. Both sprouted apples and pears this year. Even this damaged, it's a decrepit looking tree worse than the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And it sprouted pears this year. It's pretty amazing. You know, I'll cut down several trees around the property. I cut, There's a crepe myrtle that's up against my house. I cut it down, and then now it's almost the same size it was when I cut it down last year. He's saying here, verse 8, Its roots may grow old in the ground, and its stump die in the soil. It's better to be a tree and sprout forth. Verse 9, Yet at the scent of water, at the scent of water, it'll bud and put forth shoots like a plant. Is an interesting word there. Verse 10, But a man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. He's saying, where is the man? Where is he? Man gives up his spirit, and where is he? When we pass away, where will we be? What is on the other side of our last breath? I have done a lot of funerals. I've been over, a leader over half my life, and I've done a ton of funerals. I sat at many bedsides while someone took their last breath and passed away. I read the end chapters of Revelation to them. I described heaven and what they were going to see. Their bodies were frail and sometimes unrecognizable. We exit the body. And I remember looking at some of those people that passed away and I spent years hanging out with them and spending time with them and I looked at them when they passed away and all of them looked the same way. And here's how they looked. They looked like that who made them what they were exited the body and went somewhere else. That they looked, they didn't look like anything that they were when they were there. That when they left, their body didn't look like them anymore. It didn't. It was amazing. And, you know, we exit the body and then one day it goes into the ground. It gets cremated. It gets eaten by a shark. It gets lost in a fire. Whatever happens. But who we truly are leaves. And when we do, where will we end up? That's what Job is saying here. The gospel is abundantly clear. clear when we are dying, 
and I sat in a chair when I had COVID-19 and I was dying. And for two weeks, I, I sat there and I drank codeine and, and um, seltzer water because it has that, um, I forget what they call it, some long word, but it helps you to get better. And I sat there gasping for air for two weeks. And I wondered if I would fall asleep and I wouldn't wake up. Gasp to death on COVID. I didn't fear. I never feared. Because the gospel is clear. The good news is clear. I was a sinner. I got saved by grace. I would step into eternity with Jesus if I didn't heal. That I would be with him. That this thing, this spacesuit, this thing that I have, will one day go and take heart about that. You, we're never going to die. You are not going to die. Never. We think, oh, we're going to die. One day we're going to stop breathing. We'll be like the Goths. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to stop breathing one day. It's going to be so depressing. No. This thing is going to go. But we are going to go on. We don't die. We continue. Praise God. This thing stops, but we continue. Praise be to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Take heart in that. Take joy in that. Don't be like the goths out there. This spacesuit, yeah. You know, one day it goes away. But our soul, our spirit, boom, we go to be with the Lord. Praise be to God. What a beautiful thing. You know, we exit the spacesuit. Father, I thank you, Lord, um, for this wonderful message today. I praise you, Lord, and I lift my hands to you today, and I give you glory, and I thank you, Lord, that we have faith and we know eternally one day we will stand with you in eternity and it's a beautiful thing father thank you for that lord i lift up each and every person who joined us today lord i pray that you would instill in their hearts eternity lord for those that don't know you lord i pray that you would sow seeds in their lives and help them to come to know you as lord and savior i pray father for those that do lord that you would just instill that beauty of the fact that we are eternal and that we can spend eternity with you, Father. I don't want anyone on here to be eternally separated. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do everything possible to bring them to a knowledge of you. And, Father, thank you, Lord, for drawing us closer today, this beautiful message in Job. Thank you, Lord, for that. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be to God. Well, that was a pretty awesome message today. Um, Job's got quite the Philly attitude. <laughs> I think about that. I read some of his stuff and I'm like, man, I have done that. I have been sarcastic and I'll say something about somebody, something to somebody and they think I'm being serious and I'm just like being sarcastic with them and making fun of them or, you know, just the terrible stuff and I need to repent for, I need to turn away or confess later on. I mean, geez, but yeah, what a beautiful message, you know, the trees, you cut them in the roots and, you know, oh man. I'm glad that I'm moving and I'm probably going to have a new set of trees to cut at some point when I move. And I'm actually working on um, some cherry trees. I'm um, growing some cherry trees in my fridge and some peach trees right now in my fridge. I'm going to have to, um, hopefully one of the things I want to get when I get a, when we get our new home is I want to get a greenhouse. And I want to grow some cherry trees in my yard. And, you know, if they grow really well, I want to give some away. So praise God for that. But um, thank you everyone for tuning in today. I love you. I love your families. We will um, continue tomorrow on Saturday over the weekend in God's Mess of Messy Devotional. You can catch it on the Messy Devotional Guy on my YouTube page. Um, you can catch, and then you can catch Job and Revelation every week on um, my other my other one under Juniper Tree Podcast, the one I'm going from now with this premiere. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm also on TikTok, X, Facebook, and um, also on Truth Social. So I love you guys. I love your families. Hope you all have a beautiful rest of your Friday and a great weekend. If you're not working, I pray you have a nice relaxing weekend. If you're working like me all weekend, I pray that everything goes well. But have a beautiful rest of your day. I love you. love your families. Have a great day in Jesus.